Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is the continuation of the previous video that I did here. I'm with Dr. Alison Ferris. She is the program director of the Internal Medicine Residency here at FAU. And I'm here to ask her some questions about residency application. <laughs> so Sounds welcome. good. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know a little bit more about the Internal Medicine program at FAU. How is mm -hmm. it structured? Sure. So uh, the program is in year eight, I believe. We have uh, a total of 75 residents. So internal medicine residency is three years long, so that we have 24 uh, residents in each of the three classes, okay. plus we have three preliminary interns. Um, internal medicine residency sort of is a building experience. So when you start off your first year, you're really just learning day-to-day -day life, how to see patients, how to be efficient, how to write your notes, put in orders, how to answer their questions, how to work things up. You're really you know, learning just so much in a short period of time. Once you get into your second and third years, then it's really more about learning all of the more intricate things about management, about diagnosis, about um, dealing with long-term complications and effects managing a service, managing a team. Um, and, and then for them, it's also about their career exploration, figuring out what they want to do next, whether they want to specialize or not. The program is, is uh, spaced out on three sites. We have two main clinical sites. Boca Regional is our, is our prime site, Bethesda Hospital East, and then Delray Medical Center. So we use three community hospitals where the residents have a mixture of inpatient services, ICU, consultants, um, and, and so they get a chance to sort of see a broad diversity of patients, of diseases, and also get to see different hospital systems. Okay, and do they do a mix of inpatient, outpatient? How yeah, so we do, we do what's called um, X plus Y scheduling or four plus one. So the residents do four weeks of a rotation, then they do one week of, of intense clinic time. And, and what that allows us to do is to have five groups of residents mm -hmm. who rotate th through the clinic mm. so that there's five different clinic weeks. Um, okay. That allows the residents to have some continuity with their patients because they always know that every fifth week they'll be in clinic. Um, and then it also gives the residents a little bit of a breather because clinic week is a little easier than, little than easier. inpatient <laughs> weeks or ICU months. So they like that too. Plus they're guaranteed to have that Saturday and Sunday off. So they guaranteed to have a weekend off. So the residency as a whole over the three year time is about 30% outpatient and the rest is inpatient based. Okay, and the weeks that they're not in clinic, do they go the <clears throat> weekends they have to go to? Yeah, so it just depends on what rotation they're on. If they're on the ICU or an inpatient medicine service, they probably are working one of the two days of the weekend. Mm -hmm. So that they always they always average one day off a week, mm -hmm. but ha what day that is can vary. Okay, okay. So I wanted to also differentiate because um, we're now in a pandemic, as we all know. So how has the residency application process changed from the in-person process? So it's it's online. It's it's through Zoom or WebEx or Skype or whatever program your uh, organization uses. Um, so the, the application process itself has not changed. That's still mm -hmm. through a product called ERAS or the Electronic Residency Application Service. And, you know, it's basically putting yourself in a... Um, putting all of the information about you, everything about your hobbies, your interests, your special skills, your experiences, your research, your volunteering, your test scores, your transcripts, all that stuff into a, a essentially a big database. Mm -hmm. And then you designate what programs you want to apply to and those programs can see your information. Mm -hmm. And really the biggest difference is that instead of people coming and I get to meet them in person and they get to see the the town that we're in, they get to check out the beaches, they get to see the residents and meet them in person. Now all that stuff is done through a, an online day. So we've had to do some, last year we had to do some major changes. We had to create sort of like a glossy promotional video. We had to, yeah. um, you know, get 
resident, um, we have to get the residents to be involved in a different way. So they do, um, like, they do their own event the night before the interview where they get to interact, again, over the computer. Um, so it's definitely changed that. I will say that probably not surprisingly, although it was surprising for me last year, I can usually get a sense of what the candidates are like mm -hmm. over the computer interview. Um, you know, I look at my current class of interns and I don't think, I don't think any of them caught me off guard when I met them in real mm -hmm. life. Um, you know, obviously there's things like height that you, of course <laughs> you can't tell on a video. Um, but other than that, like I pretty much could figure them all out based on their application, their interview, mm -hmm. how they interacted, how their mannerisms were. So it actually does not serve as a disadvantage by doing it online. And at the end of the day, I actually like it better because it's much more fair across the board because mm -hmm. people don't have to break the bank traveling mm -hmm. and deciding what money to spend and what money not to spend. So right. I think that's a, you know, it's definitely a more equitable process across the board. Right. And how long is the interview? How is it? So our interviews, we we have about a four hour period of time with the applicants, which is actually shorter than mm -hmm. our real life day was. Right. Um, but it's about a four hour day, starts with a, a welcome and a presentation by me. Then they we have our applicants get two interviews. One is with me mm -hmm. and one is with another faculty member. We do standardized interviews, so everyone gets asked the same series of, of questions. Okay. Um, again, trying to keep it a, a pretty equitable, fair process. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then in between interviews, we have sort of like a waiting room where the applicants can chat with each other, can talk to our coordinators. We try to get some residents to pop into the Zoom room. And then we always end with uh, a video tour as well as a Q&A with some of our residents okay. um, so that they can give them sort of like, you know, last minute, last minute questions that come up, things like that. That's good. For the application, for internal medicine residency, is research needed and if it is, what mm -hmm. type? So a lot of that really depends on you as an individual candidate and what your goals are for residency. Mm -hmm. So if you are a, a stellar student, amazing scores, you know, lots of volunteering and, you know, you're looking at, at things like Gold Humanism and AOA, you know, research does play a role in your selection to things like AOA. So if that's your one of your goals, you certainly want to, to be doing some stuff. Similarly, if your goal is to go to a really academic program that does a lot of research that everybody ends up going into a subspecialty, you know, mm -hmm. programs like, um, like Duke or Stanford or um, Mass General, you know, you probably want to be doing some research to prove that you will fit into the type of program and the style that they have. On the other hand, if, if you don't love research and that's not your goal in life, you don't plan on, you know, developing the next greatest monoclonal antibody therapy for whatever, um, <laughs> that's okay too. But, you know, if you're going to get involved in research, um, you want it to be something that you have an interest in because that'll help you want to do it mm -hmm. um, but also something that you can accomplish in the time frame you need to accomplish it in because you want to be able to talk about it in your interview process so right. um, you know for me personally it is not a must if somebody if I look at an application that doesn't have any research experience that doesn't matter to me but certainly other programs and other other program directors feel differently. So really it depends on what your goals are ultimately. Okay, yeah. And what about step scores now with step uh, one being Yeah, fail? so that's How? really the, the magic question. So historically step scores have always mattered. Um, but again, depending on what program and how picky and selective they want to be, it that's where the step score number um, 
came into play. As step one goes to pass fail, I suspect, and again, this is just my opinion, not not gospel from any organization, I suspect mm-hmm. program directors are going to look at step two scores and are going to put a lot more weight and a lot more um, importance on step two uh, clinical knowledge, the CK. I, you know, I think what will eventually happen outside of your time when you're, you know, probably in attending is that that will also become pass fail. Um, I do you think I like, do. I think that will eventually happen. Yeah, it'll take mm-hmm. years, but I think it'll happen. Um, I, you know, ultimately, I think I understand the reasoning mm-hmm. to make it pass fail. I understand the the push, but I think it it actually is very hurtful to some applicants mm-hmm. um, to have a pass fail on that because there is something to be said for standardized test taking and standardized test scores. Um, so I, I hope everything doesn't go to pass fail. Mm-hmm. I, I hope there are some things in the world that still have some some mm-hmm. differentiation um, right. in it. But uh, yeah, it'll, it'll just make the application review a little harder for yeah. me. Yeah, no, and especially people coming from different schools, yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly if if I have applicants from, you know, 147 U.S. medical schools plus, you know, I don't know, 10 or 12 Caribbean schools plus, uh, you know, hundreds of international medical schools, mm-hmm. one of the things that is very easy to compare people by are scores, for better or for worse. Um, but, you know, whatever happens, we'll roll with it. We'll figure out a new a new solution. For the international medical graduates, are they um, access different in the application in terms of... Um, what do you mean by access different? Uh, reviewed in, in terms oh. of they need more more things to... So, um, you know, certainly international graduates, one thing that we look for is um, that they've had U.S. clinical experience. Mm. Now, you know, that became very, very hard when COVID hit because not only did international travel get shut down in a lot of instances, but hospitals really closed their doors to certainly to observers and clinical externs from out, outside the system, but even to medical students, right. um, you know, from, from their home institutions. So U.S. clinical experience is really important um, in my mind for international graduates um, mm-hmm. because the, U- the, the medical system is very different country to country and having it's it's not so much the pathophysiology knowledge or the pathology or the pharmacology knowledge but it's really the day-to-day how to doctor Mm -hmm. in the u.s that is different than in other places so that's the most critical thing that we look at you know international graduates who are coming to the united states and trying to come to the united states they generally have amazingly high step scores they all um you know, have various research experiences. They have, their schooling is different than it is in the United States. So they have sort of a combined college, um, college slash medical school experience, Mm -hmm. which also includes a year of working in the hospital. Right. So, you know, they have just a very different background background and, and trying to compare them to, you know, what you guys are getting Mm -hmm. at FAU is, is, it's apples and oranges in a lot of instances. So, um, so I think you know international graduates looking for that clinical experience in the United States is key. And uh, what are some of the job opportunities that you have within internal medicine? Oh, you have so many. Um, so I think you know first is deciding: do you want to do general internal medicine or primary care internal medicine or hospital medicine versus specializing? So internal medicine is like the hub for many of the other subspecialties. So I will quickly name as many as I can. Cardiology, GI, nephrology, endocrine, rheumatology, Rheumatology. infectious diseases. (laughs) um, uh, Let's see. Geriatrics, hospice palliative medicine, um, critical care, uh, hematology, oncology, I think that's all of them. If I missed any, I'm super sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so, 
So if you want, you, you know, one of the things you try to figure out is do you want to specialize or do you want to stay internal medicine? You know, if you specialize, then, you know, right after residency comes fellowship. So that training is anywhere from one to three years of, of tra- additional training. And then some specialties have subspecialties. So for example, cardiology, you can do general cardiology and then you can further subspecialize and do interventional cardiology, which is doing like catheterization procedures. You can do electrophysiology, which is the electrical system of the heart and pacemakers and ICDs and Mm -hmm. stuff. You can do structural heart disease, like valve disease. You can do heart failure transplant. So, you know, those, that adds on another one or two or three years to training. So just depends how how super specialized you want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, job opportunities for for straight out of residency internal mm-hmm. medicine folks. You can go into outpatient medicine and be in a clinic. You can do hospitalist medicine, mm-hmm. either daytime or nighttime or mixture of the two. You can do academics where you're you're doing teaching plus patient care combined, what you're doing. which is sort of what I do, which is what I do, not sort of, <laughs> it is what I do. And then there's certainly opportunities to do like urgent care jobs. You can do what's called locums, meaning you can travel around mm-hmm. and be stationed at a place for a period of time covering, you know, a, ne- a need there, whether it's a doctor out on maternity leave or um, they're just lacking inpatient doctors right now and they need people to work. So and there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of options. Mm-hmm. Um, and the good news is that you can pretty much get a job anywhere in the United States as a board certified internist. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> um, for the medical students that are going to internal medicine mm-hmm. rotations, yeah. how do you stand out? That's a great yeah. question. Um, so I think, you know, this is really true for any of your rotations, but um, y- you want to be engaged. You want to be involved in your team. Mm -hmm. Um, So you want to be present. Um, You want to be, and and present doesn't just mean physically being there, but but actually being attentive, listening actively, asking questions about things that you don't know, um, answering questions when you do know. I think that's one of the ways to really stand out on a service. Um, I think, you know, definitely volunteering to either go see new patients or looking up topics to present back to the team. Those are all ways that you'll make an impression on your your team and your attendings. Okay. Yes. Like you really want to be there, right? Yeah. Yeah. You want to show like you're excited. <laughs> okay. And then any advice for medical students preparing for to apply to residency? I think you know the first thing is just make sure that your that your heart is in it make sure you that's really what you want to do whether it's internal medicine or pediatrics or OB or surgery whatever it is you want to make sure that it really is what you want to spend your life doing now I realize that's also hard because sometimes you don't know but I think that's the that's the most important thing is really when you're in those early days of medical school in those first couple years Really go to those interest group meetings, talk to the people, learn about their fields, you know, try to get opportunities where you can hear more about it and see it up close. When you're on your rotations, you know, there's stuff that you don't necessarily get direct exposure to. So if there's a possibility that you really like the radiology stuff, see if you can go to radiology and talk to the radiologist someday. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have a patient that got a CAT scan, volunteer to go talk to radiology about the scan or you know if your resident you know sort of says oh I think I'm going to go see radiology offer to go with them so that you get a chance to see some of those aspects of medicine that aren't sort of the bread and butter you know standard clerkships that you do I think the other thing too is you know remember your residency application is more than test scores and transcripts it's who else are you as a person Mm-hmm. Make sure you still have other things that you like to do, volunteer activities, personal life activities, hobbies, um, you know, have things that make you who you are mm-hmm. and don't let those fall by the wayside just because you're in medical school. Because really most residency programs, um, they want to know who you are as a, as a person, not just as, uh, as, as a, a student. 
Thank you. And to finish off this interview, I just wanted to ask uh, for lifelong learning. I know all doctors have to yeah. do that. <laughs> What kinds of things do you do to keep up with all of this knowledge? <laughs> that's a it's a very good question. Um, I will f freely admit that I probably <laughs> don't keep up as much as I would like to. Um, I have a stack of journals at my house that I periodically go through in big chunks of time. Um, I should really read them on a regular basis, and I keep telling myself I will, but then I don't. Um, I think with lifelong learning, it's it really comes back to, you know, if you like what you do and you enjoy what you do, you're going to want to keep learning about it. So I think that's part of it is, is it comes very naturally when you like your job and you like what you're doing. I think the other thing too is, you know, I, you put yourself in a position where you're pushed by the people around you. So, you know, I work with residents who are constantly <laughs> reading the latest study and trials. And um, so I have to keep up with them. <laughs> so it's a great motivator to keep working. Um, I think the other thing, too, is ultimately the reason that we need to be lifelong learners and the reason that we have to keep up with mm -hmm. the changing pace of medicine is for our patients. So, you know, like you'll hear over and over again, if you keep patients at the center of what you're doing, you won't go wrong. So again, if you just remember that your need to read and learn and keep up is for your patients, right. I think that's also a great motivator. Yes. Thank you. You're and with welcome. that, we finished the video today. Thank you so much You're so for welcome. being here with me and sharing all of this amazing advice. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you for watching. Thank you. <laughs>